Good evening. On behalf of the staff at the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds in Dusseldorf, welcome. And thank you for listening to tonight's broadcast. My name is Lector Finn J.D. John, Master Librarian at the von Junst Library's Corvallis Branch. It is good to have you with us tonight. Tonight we will be reading Chapter 6 of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. But first, I must continue the tragic story of the founder and namesake of our library of sinister and forgotten lore, of our own martyr to man's thirst for knowledge, the late lamented Friedrich Wilhelm von Junst. In telling these well-worn tales, I again crave the indulgence and forgiveness of our long-time listeners who have tuned in to our signal, broadcast from the aerial atop the Great Stone Tower in Dusseldorf since we first went on the air in 1924. As I said, when Dr. von Junst returned to his library from his last journey, he immediately went into the Great Stone Tower and bolted the door from the inside and we believe he may have had recourse to a supernatural augmentation of some kind in sealing the door, for no bolts can stand against the concentrated force of will of the Council of Prefects, and they found themselves standing without the walls of the great stone tower, perplexed and worried. Hoping that they might be able to ward off any evil forces that might come for their friend, the twelve ranged themselves around the tower, but found the obstacles placed by Dr. von Junst, both natural and unnatural, placed him beyond their protective influence. And so when the forces came to take Dr. von Junst, they could only lurk. The following morning, at three o'clock precisely, the Council of Twelve suddenly felt the defenses that had kept them out of the Great Stone Tower falter and fail. At the same time, the malevolent forces were perceived to withdraw and vanish into the depths of the outer gulfs, leaving only a few dozen brass bolts and steel bars barricading the doors of the Great Stone Tower. These were quickly neutralized, and the Twelve hurried across the threshold into the tower. There upon the floor his half-face etched with horror and suffused with uncirculated blood, lay the body of Dr. von Junst. On his throat were clearly left the marks of what looked like human fingers, with talons extending from the end of each, and face down on his writing desk lay the only copy of the Chor Negral. The twelve prefects knew that if the first rays of dawn caught the Chor Negral still in the physical world, it would crumble to dust. It had been protected from its ancient curse of self-destruction by Professor von Junst's metapsychological powers. If it were to be saved from destruction, something would have to be done in the next two hours before dawn. The twelve prefects quickly conferred among themselves. There was never any doubt or dissent as to what they had to do. They were of one mind, as they have always been of one mind, save for only once in July of 1914. Uh, but that is another story for another time. The Council of Prefects quickly closed the door and collected the Chor Negral, as well as Dr. von Junst's copious notes, and made the preparations that they knew they would have to make. I will tell of how they proceeded, and of what success they met with in doing so, in tomorrow's broadcast. For now, it is time once again to turn to our reading from the collection of the von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds, Edgar Rice Burroughs' 1912 account of his uncle's adventure, titled A Princess of Mars. Let us begin. Chapter 6. A Fight That Won Friends the thing, which more nearly resembled our earthly men than it did the Martians I had seen, held me pinioned to the ground with one huge foot while it jabbered and gesticulated at some answering creature behind me. The other, which was evidently its mate, soon came toward us, bearing a mighty stone cudgel with which it evidently intended to brain me. The creatures were about ten or fifteen feet tall, standing erect, and had, like the green Martians, an intermediary set of arms or legs, midway between their upper and lower limbs. Their eyes were close together and non-protruding, their ears were set high, 
but more laterally located than those of the Martians, while their snouts and teeth were strikingly like those of our African gorilla. Altogether, they were not unlovely when viewed in comparison with the green Martians. The cudgel was swinging in the arc which ended upon my upturned face when a bolt of myriad-legged horror hurled itself through the doorway full upon the breast of my executioner. With a shriek of fear, the ape which held me leaped through the open window, but its mate closed in a terrific death struggle with my preserver, which was nothing less than my faithful watch thing. I cannot bring myself to call so hideous a creature a dog. As quickly as possible I gained my feet, and backing against the wall I witnessed such a battle as it is vouchsafed few beings to see. The strength, agility, and blind ferocity of these two creatures is approached by nothing known to earthly man. My beast had an advantage in his first hold, having sunk his mighty fangs far into the breast of his adversary, but the great arms and paws of the ape, backed by muscles far transcending those of the Martian men I had seen, had locked the throat of my guardian and were slowly choking out his life and bending back his head and neck upon his body where I momentarily expected the former to fall limp at the end of a broken neck. In accomplishing this, the ape was tearing away the entire front of its breast, which was held in a vice-like grip by the powerful jaws. Back and forth upon the floor they rolled, neither one emitting a sound of fear or pain. Presently I saw the great eyes of the beast bulging completely from their sockets and blood flowing from its nostrils. That he was weaking perceptibly was evident, but so also was the ape whose struggles were growing momentarily less. Suddenly I came to myself, and with that strange instinct which seems to ever prompt me to duty, I seized the cudgel which had fallen to the floor at the commencement of the battle, and swinging it with all the power of my earthly arms, I crushed it full upon the head of the ape, crushing his skull as though it had been an eggshell. Scarcely had the blow descended when I was confronted with a new danger. The ape's mate, recovered from its first shock of terror, had returned to the scene of the encounter by way of the interior of the building. I glimpsed him just before he reached the doorway, and the sight of him now roaring as he perceived his lifeless fellow stretched upon the floor and frothing at the mouth in the extremity of his rage filled me, I must confess, with dire forebodings. I am ever willing to stand and fight when the odds are not too overwhelmingly against me, but in this instance I perceive neither glory nor profit in pitting my relatively puny strength against the iron muscles and brutal ferocity of this deranged citizen of an unknown world. In fact, the only outcome of such an encounter, so far as I could be concerned, seemed sudden death. I was standing near the window, and I knew that once in the street I could gain the plaza and safety before the creature could overtake me. At least there was a chance for safety and flight against almost certain death should I remain and fight, however desperately. It is true I held the cudgel, but what could I do with it against his four great arms? Even should I break one of them with my first blow, for I figured he would attempt to ward off the cudgel, he would reach out and annihilate me with the others before I could recover for a second attack. In the instant that these thoughts passed through my mind, I had turned to make for the window, but my eyes alighting on the form of my erstwhile guardian threw all thoughts of flight to the four winds. He lay gasping upon the floor of the chamber, his great eyes fastened upon me in what seemed like a pitiful appeal for protection. I could not withstand that look, nor could I on second thought have deserted my rescuer without giving as good an account of myself in his behalf as he had in mine. Without more ado, therefore, I turned to meet the charge of the infuriated bull ape. He was now too close upon me for the cudgel to prove of any effective assistance, so I merely threw it as heavily as I could at his advancing bulk. It struck him just below the knees, eliciting a howl of pain and rage, and so throwing him off his balance that he lunged full upon me with arms wide stretched to ease his fall. Again, as on the preceding day, I had recourse to earthly tactics, and swinging my right fist full upon the point of his chin, I followed it with a smashing left to the pit of his stomach. The effect was marvelous for as I lightly sidestepped after delivering the second blow, he reeled and fell upon the floor doubled up with pain and gasping for wind. Leaping over his prostrate body, I seized his cudgel and finished the monster before he could regain his feet. As I delivered the blow, a low laugh rang out behind me, and turning I beheld Tars Tarkas, Sola, and three or four warriors standing in the doorway of the chamber. As my eyes met theirs, I was for the second time the recipient of their zealously guarded applause. 
My absence had been noted by Sola upon her awakening, and she had quickly informed Tars Tarkas, who had set out immediately with a handful of warriors to search for me. As they had approached the limits of the city, they had witnessed the actions of the bull ape as he bolted into the building, frothing with rage. They had followed immediately behind him, thinking it barely possible that his actions might prove a clue to my whereabouts, and had witnessed my short but decisive battle with him. The encounter, together with my set to with the Martian warrior on the previous day and my feats of jumping, placed me upon a high pinnacle in their regard. Evidently devoid of all the finer sentiments of friendship, love, or affection, these people fairly worship physical prowess and bravery, and nothing is too good for the object of their adoration as long as he maintains his position with repeated examples of his skill, strength, and courage. Sola, who had accompanied the searching party of her own volition, was the only one of the Martians whose face had not been twisted with laughter as I battled for my life. She, on the contrary, was sober with apparent solicitude, and as soon as I had finished the monster, rushed to me and carefully examined my body for possible wounds or injuries. Satisfying herself that I had come off unscathed, she smiled quietly and, taking my hand, started toward the door of the chamber. Tars Tarkas and the other warriors had entered and were standing over the rapidly reviving brute which had saved my life and whose life I in turn had rescued. They seemed to be deep in argument, and finally one of them addressed me, but remembering my ignorance of his language turned back to Tars Tarkas, who, with a word and a gesture, gave some command to the fellow and turned to follow us from the room. There seemed to be something menacing in their attitude toward my beast, and I hesitated to leave until I had learned the outcome. It was well that I did so, for the warrior drew an evil-looking pistol from its holster and was on the point of putting an end to the creature when I sprang forward and struck up his arm. The bullet striking the wooden casing of the window exploded, blowing a hole completely through the wooden masonry. I then knelt down beside the fearsome-looking thing, and raising it to its feet, motioned for it to follow me. The looks of surprise which my action elicited from the Martians were ludicrous. They could not understand, except in a feeble and childish way, such attributes as gratitude and compassion. The warrior whose gun I had struck up looked inquiringly at Tars Tarkas, but the latter signed that I should be left to my own devices, and so we returned to the plaza with my great beast following close at heel and Sola grasping me tightly by the arm. I had at least two friends on Mars, a young woman who watched over me with motherly solicitude and a dumb brute which, as I later came to know, held in its poor ugly carcass more love, more loyalty, more gratitude than could have been found in the entire five million green Martians who roved the deserted cities and dead sea bottoms of Mars. That's all we have time for tonight, listeners. This broadcast is a production of the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds, with branches in Dusseldorf, Strigoikovar, and Corvallis. To learn more about our extratemporal institution of forgotten learning, please turn to our hub page at von-junst.org. Or, if you prefer to visit in person, simply come to Dusseldorf on a clear moonless night, rent or purchase a small skiff, and silently paddle north on the Rhine until you see the great stone tower rising from its eastern banks. One day soon I will tell our newer listeners why this elaborate visitation ritual is necessary, although it will be more clear after tomorrow night's broadcast. Thank you once again, listeners. Good night, and as always, I wish you tantalizing 